Thank you very much. Uh, so I will continue with the topic of yesterday's lecture. Uh, so just to have a brief uh, recall of what we did, uh, what we did in the last lecture yesterday. Um, basically, we are studying two problems, uh, which are the two free boundary problems, the obstacle problem, and the Bernoulli or one phase problem, right? And then for both of them, we proved several properties already that are the following. So first, the, we saw that the problem, these problems are scale invariant. Okay, so in the sense that we can rescale the original function uh, with the natural scaling parameter, and then we get a rescale function u r such that the L infinity norm is always comparable to one. So we are around a free boundary point, and then this is our solution u, and then we kind of zoom in from the ball br into the ball b1, and we get a new function u r that solves the same problem, I mean, solves the same equation, still a minimizer of the energy. Uh, and then we, ha we have optimal regularity and non-degeneracy, which tells us that these functions are non-trivial, uh, these functions you are, are non-trivial and don't go to, to zero, okay? And don't go to infinity. And then in particular, we can take limits and we have that these functions you are, these scalings you are converge as R going to zero to a blow up, okay? That we call U zero. Uh, and they converge locally uniformly in a REN. And this function U, U zero uh, turns out to be homogeneous thanks to a monotonicity formula, okay? so. So this function u0, which is the blow up, turns out to be uh, still a solution or a minimizer of the energy. And in addition, we have one extra information, which is that they are homogeneous, right? And then this was common in both problems, in, in the obstacle problem and the Bernoulli problem. And now we said, okay, the next steps, if we think about the strategy for minimal surfaces, the next steps would be to first try to prove a classification of blow ups, right? Then once we have a classification of blow-ups, if we can show that they are flat, uh, then we should prove that flat implies, <clears throat> flat implies C1 alpha. Uh, and then we prove that once the free boundary is C1 alpha, then it's actually C infinity. Okay, so these are the steps that are missing in a sense, right? And then uh, in the classification of blow-ups, I said that we will see that the two problems are actually quite different. So we start with one of them, which is the Bernoulli problem. Right? And then we saw that uh, for the Bernoulli problem in dimensions one and two, we can classify blow ups okay? by simply looking at the equation. Okay? So we look at the equation, which is, the, is this one, right? and we look for one homogeneous solutions. So solutions that are homogeneous at degree one. And then in dimension one, it was very easy to see that this is the only solution and this is the one D solution, it's the positive part of X. And then in dimension two, this was a bit more complicated and we had to use some, some properties of positive harmonic functions in cones, okay? But we could also prove uh, basically that the only possible solution that is homogeneous of degree one and solves this equation is the, the 1D solution in dimension two, in, in, we are in R2, uh, which is this one. Okay, so this is what we saw in the last lecture. So basically, just to summarize, uh, this is the theorem that we proved. Okay, so classification of blow ups for the Bernoulli problem in dimensions one and two. Okay, and for this, uh, so we show that all blow ups are of the form uh, positive part of a linear function to the origin. Okay, so for any just up to a rotation, this is simply uh, Xn positive part. Okay, and for this, we only used this equation, which is the equation that blow ups satisfy. Right, so looking at the equation, we could prove this in dimensions one and two. Now, what happens in dimension three or even higher? Well, we should uh, be more careful in this case because, uh, so this is the picture of the 1D solution. We should, in, in higher dimensions, these are still solutions, of course, and these are the ones that we expect uh, to happen at regular points, but there, there might be other solutions in higher dimensions, okay? And this is indeed the case. So uh, being a solution is not anymore enough in order to classify them and saying that the only solution is this one, because in dimensions three or higher, we can construct solutions of this kind, okay? So we take a actually symmetric cone like this, and we set u equals zero on the cone, 
and then we look for a positive harmonic function outside this cone. And then it's very easy to see just by continuity. When the cone is too small, then the homogeneity uh, is close to zero. When the cone, this, this cone where you zero is too large, then the homogeneity is larger and goes to infinity. So there will be one and only one uh, opening of this cone such that this function is homogeneous of degree one. So there is a solution uh, of this form to this equation. So, and it's really a solution. It satisfies the three properties. So just because it is homogeneous of degree one and the gradient will be constant. The gradient will be homogeneous of degree zero. And then by symmetry, it is constant along all the boundary of the cone. So along all the free boundary, the gradient is constant. So you can set the constant to be one. Okay. so there is really a solution in dimension three or higher to this equation. Okay, now, does this mean that this can appear as a blow up? Well, no, because a priori, so we are studying the Bernoulli problem and we are studying minimizers of the energy, right? So, and I'm not claiming now that this solution that we found is a minimizer of the energy. So simply because it's a solution, it, then it will be a critical point. But if we are looking at minimizers, then blow ups will be also minimizers. And therefore, uh, we have to check, we have to, to try to discover if these solutions are minimizers or not. OK, so this is the next question. So are these solutions uh, that appear in all dimensions, three or higher, are these solutions I mean, minimizers or not? And then. If you think about uh, minimal surfaces, so for those of you who know uh, a bit more about minimal surfaces, what happens is that there is the Simon's cone. And this is a cone which turns out to be a minimizer in dimensions eight or higher, but not in dimension seven or lower. Okay, so maybe the same happens here. And then this is the analogous of the Simon's cone in a sense, right? And then uh, this is indeed the case. And then this was proved uh, by Caffarelli, Jerison, and Kenick. Uh, and this is a proposition that says that these solutions, these actually symmetric solutions that are somehow explicit, uh, these solutions are unstable in dimensions up to six. So if you are in dimensions n less or equal than six, these solutions are unstable. And in particular, they, they are not minimizers. Okay, And if they are not minimizers, they cannot appear as blow ups because we are looking at minimizers. Uh, so they cannot, I mean, the blow up will be a minimizer as well. And therefore, uh, these solutions cannot appear as blow ups. OK. And therefore, and then, so this is the more, I mean, this is really a deep result uh, due to Caffarelli, Jerison, and Kenick, and Jerison and Sabine uh, in 2001 and 2015. This is much more deep in a sense. Because, so this first result that I said here, is that these explicit solutions are unstable in dimensions up to six, okay? While this result is really the classification of blow ups. I mean, this is the best known result in terms of classification of blow ups uh, in, in higher dimensions, okay? And then it says that we proved it here in dimensions one and two, then Caffarelli, Jerison, and Kenick in 2001, they proved it in dimension three, and more recently, Jerison and Sabine in 2015 proved it in dimension four. And this is very difficult to prove. Uh, it says that in dimensions n less or equal than four, all blow ups are the 1D solution, this 1D solution. Okay. And then how is this proved? Well, because you have to use not only that blow ups are solutions to this, but also that they are minimizers of the energy. Okay. So, uh, and then on the other hand, uh, so this uh, proposition is completed in a sense with this other result of uh, Daniela da Silva and David Jerison in 2009 that says that this conical solution is a minimizer in dimension seven. Okay, so this is this six and seven is sharp uh, in the sense that these solution, these actually symmetric solutions are not minimizers, so they cannot appear as blow ups in, up to dimension six, but they do uh, appear in dimension seven. Okay. And then in the general case, in, in terms of classification of blow ups, the best known result is up to dimension four. And the problem is open uh, in dimensions five and six. So in dimension five and six, we know that this is not a minimizer, 
but we don't know, even though we expect uh, that there are no other minimizers, we don't know if there are other minimizers in dimensions five and six, and this is a very nice and challenging open problem. Okay, so how can we how can we improve this result, the classification of low ups in dimensions three and four? Okay, so so remember we have to use the equation, but we only need to use also the fact that the blow up is a minimizer of the fun of the energy function. Okay, so how do we use this? Well, uh, first notice if, if I call this energy the the E of U, the, the energy uh, associated to the Bernoulli problem. Uh, what we have is that for any perturbation U epsilon of our solution U, for any perturbation, we will have this, that for any perturbation, it will have more energy, right? And then we may consider, I mean, this is uh, very typical in this context, we consider domain variations, okay? So you consider, you fix the domain of corresponding to the U, to your function U, and it's this one, and this is the free boundary corresponding to the function U, and then you consider any, I mean, any other function uh, that is basically obtained by a perturbation of your original function u under a domain variation. So with a change of a smooth change of variables and smooth diffeomorphism that moves your free boundary from here to here. Okay, and then you compare the energy of for your new competitor in a sense. Okay, and then your new competitor must have more energy than the original solution u. Okay, and then as I said, this is a domain variation of this type. So you consider u under a change of variables, say, uh, x plus epsilon phi of x, where phi of x is a diffeomorphism, uh, say, it's infinity with compact support. Uh, so the identity plus epsilon phi is the diffeomorphism. And then uh, since use a minimizer, and then we have this, then we can differentiate in epsilon uh, to, twice to get that the second variation is not negative. Okay, so the second derivative with respect to epsilon, because we are at a minimum, uh, this should be not negative. And then this is basically uh, this, the, the, the second variation of the functional with respect to the domain variations is not negative, right? So this is called the stability condition, uh, which of course needs to be computed. So, so the, the point here is that this thing, so you take these explicit competitors, these explicit functions, your epsilon, then you can compute explicitly this quantity here, okay? So this gives you a new condition, which is the stability condition for this problem, okay? So this is the stability condition. And then uh, let us let me sketch the idea of the proof of the classification of low ups in 3D, in dimension three, right? Which is the physical space. So it's nice and it's also uh, easier and completely different from the case, uh, from the proof of the, um, Jerison and Sabine in dimension four. Okay, so in dimension three, we can proceed as follows. So since our solution U is a minimizer, then in particular, it's stable. So we compute the second variation of the energy functional, which is what I explained in the last slide. And then we find, so this is non-trivial, but one can compute everything, okay, with this domain variation and so on. And you find that for any test function that is infinite with compact support, uh, you have this. So this is the free boundary. I mean, this, this is the free boundary. This is the set where u is positive. And for any test function, the stability condition turns out to be the following, that the integral and the positivity region of gradient eta square for any test function eta is bigger or equal than the integral on the free boundary of the mean curvature of the free boundary times eta square. Okay. And uh, so, this, uh, of course, is not very explicit because then you don't know still what is the, the main curvature because the free boundary is unknown. So this domain is unknown, but we can still get some information from it, okay? So basically, this is the picture. We have a, a conic type solution, a cone type solution. So we are in R3 and then it's a homogeneous solution. So, so the free boundary is a cone uh, and the, the positivity region is a cone and then this is the picture that we should have in mind. Okay, so we integrate in this region greater than eta square, and then this should be bigger or equal than the mean integral on the boundary of the mean curvature times eta square, okay, for any, any test function. And now 
that is one first step which says that thanks to the maximum principle you can prove that the mean curvature is actually non-negative okay this comes from really a maximum principle argument uh, coming from the problem and then once you have this uh, if the mean curvature is non-negative right we are in 3d so the mean curvature you can look at it on the sphere okay and then this is something that does not happen in higher dimensions right so here i'm using very strongly that i'm a cone in 3d but a cone in 3d that has a mean curvature that is not negative it must be a union so the set where u equals zero must be a union of convex cones so this for example this curvature here would be negative right this cannot happen if i know that the mean curvature is not negative right so this must be really convex a convex cone because the mean curvature is uh, I mean this is really a one D problem if you look at it on the sphere. So the mean curvature is really like the curvature on the sphere of this curve. So each of these curves uh, is convex. Okay, so you might have several components, but each of each of them is a convex cone. Okay, so here we use very strongly that we are in three D. Okay, but then this is now very useful because now we take a, a radial function eta. Okay. And then uh, you write this condition in terms of uh, so because age is uh, homogeneous, right? So I can basically uh, separate into the radial component and the non-radial component, the, the the component on the sphere, right? And then in this way, the etas go here, and the everything that happens on the sphere goes here separately. So you can really separate variables in a sense. Now, uh, because I'm taking eta a radial function, then I get something like this. So the gradient eta square, you get r square eta prime square. Okay, and then this is an integral uh, from zero to infinity, the radial variable. And here I get the integral from zero to infinity of eta square. Okay, and this th these things are fixed. These things, these two terms, do not depend on eta. So now I can optimize in eta. I take the, the best eta or the worst eta as you can uh, you can decide in a sense what eta. So you optimize in eta so that this quotient, so this is as close as possible to this. So you optimize in eta, which is basically taking a function of the form r to the power minus one half. You have to approximate it because you're gonna take it directly, but this is the idea. You take a function similar to this negative power, okay? I think it's epsilon minus one half and then in epsilon and et cetera. So, and then you optimize in eta and then you deduce that basically uh, with this choice, this and this become, I mean, they cancel and they become a one fourth, a constant. Okay, so you get that one fourth this term. Okay, and what was this term? Well, this term is the measure of this set, which is the measure where U is positive. The blow up is positive. Okay, on the sphere. Okay, the, the the part of the measure of the part of the sphere in which the blow up is positive, and then this must be bigger or equal than the integral on the sphere of this mean curvature. Okay, but this is really the curvature of the curve of this curve on the sphere. Okay. And now, since h, as I said, is also the curvature of this curve on the sphere, so here I'm using again that we are in 3D very strongly. Uh, because uh, basically, the, well, this does not happen in higher dimensions. In 3D, really, the intersection of the cone with the sphere is a curve, and the mean curvature is really the curvature of this curve. Then uh, we can use Gauss bonnet to deduce that basically you, you use here Gauss bonnet, and then you deduce that you get a contradiction unless this, uh, the, the free boundary, has only one connected component. So basically, integrating the curvature of a closed curve would give you a, a larger number than this unless uh, there is only one connected component okay so by gauss bonnet basically the more connected components you have the larger is this number the integral of the curvature okay and then it turns out that you get that uh, a contradiction unless there is only one connected component okay so you end up with a cone that now we know it is comp so the the zero cone the the, co the region where u is zero it is uh, one connected component and it's a convex one 
because we knew it already. So we have a convex cone, as I said, where u is zero. Okay, but then now uh, by so by convexity, uh, basically any convex cone is contained in a half space. Okay, but now we can use again this comparison of homogeneities. So I have a convex cone; it is contained in a half space. But for the half space, I already know that the homogeneity is one. Okay, so because for the half space, I already know that the homogeneity is one, and I have proved that my my I mean the only possibility is that I have a convex cone in particular contained in a half space. You get a contradiction unless it was already the half space. Okay, so the homogeneity cannot be one unless you are the half space. Okay, so this is basically the sketch of the proof uh, for dimension three. Okay, uh, and as I said, we used several times and very strongly that we are in a three, and the proof in dimension four is completely different. Okay, but I will not I will not discuss the proof in dimension four. Okay, so basically this is what uh, we now know. Okay, so we know that for the Bernoulli problem. Uh, in dimensions S less or equal than four, well, we saw the proof after dimension three, basically, then all blow-ups are of the form uh, of this form. So these are the 1D solution. So in dimensions one, two, three, and four, there are no other possible blow-ups. Okay, so at any free boundary point, you rescale, you do the blow-up, and you get this, always, at, in all dimensions uh, up to dimension four. Okay, so now how can we use this? This is already the classification of blow ups, uh, at least in low dimensions, that we wanted, right? And now can, we have to use this in order to deduce something about the free boundary, right? So prove that the free boundary is very nice. So this implies that as we zoom in, we rescale, uh, and then these rescaled functions converge to this one, this solution, right? So this is basically what uh, we proved. So these rescale functions converge to this 1D solution. So in particular, uh, like before the limit, these free boundaries become flatter and flatter. Okay, so this is something you can prove that if, because in the limit, they are completely flat. Before the limit, this free boundary is contained in a strip, say of width uh, epsilon. Okay, so it's contained be between, is trapped, this free boundary is trapped between two very close parallel hyperplanes. Okay, so, in particular, you can make it very flat. Okay, and then the following result is the analog of the one of the Georgie for minimal surfaces in this context, and it says the following. So this is due to Alt and Caffarelli in '81, and it says that uh, if U is a minimizer uh, for the Bernoulli problem, such that the free boundary is contained in a very narrow uh, strip. Okay, so this is very flat. So you have no assumption about the free boundary. So you have no regularity, you don't know it's a graph, you don't know anything, but you know it's very flat. Okay, so this is the flatness assumption. This is very typical from this kind of, of problems. So if the free boundary is flat with epsilon small enough, then it is actually a C1 alpha surface in the half ball. Say. Okay, so this is really the flatness implies C1 alpha. Okay, and then is it, this step is where you pass, I mean, this is very, delicate and usually like it's like at the core of the regularity theory. This is where you pass from an assumption saying in which you don't know it's a graph, you don't know anything, but you only know it is very flat, thanks to the classification of blow ups, you know it's very flat. And then you pass to saying that actually, because it is very flat, it will actually be a graph. It will not only be a flat graph, but actually a C1 alpha graph. So it is locally uh, a C1 alpha surface. Okay, and this is the, the uh, classical theorem of Alton Caffarelli uh, in this context. And then in the, I will not basically, uh, I will not discuss. Uh, this is one of the most important steps together with the classification of blow ups. Uh, but the proof is uh, too long and technical to be discussed uh, here in, uh, in this series of lectures. So uh, I will not discuss the proof. Here. Okay, so you can, uh, but we will see a similar result for the obstacle problem. Okay, so this is the, the uh, crucial step in the theory. And then thanks to the classification of low ups and this flat implies C1 alpha theorem, we know that the free boundary is now C1 alpha 
at every free boundary point in dimensions n less or equal than four. Okay, so as a consequence of all these results, in dimensions n less or equal than four, the free boundary is a C1 alpha surface everywhere. Okay, so there are no singular points and everything is C1 alpha. Okay, so whenever I say C1 alpha, it means there exists a small alpha that depends on the dimension such that this is true. Okay, so the alpha is really not very explicit, but there exists an alpha for which this is true. Okay, and uh, so in higher dimensions, you could say, okay, but this, in, this is in low dimensions and less or equal than four. What happens in higher dimensions? Well, then using the bias monotonicity formula and a dimension reduction argument that is also uh, comes from minimal surfaces, basically, uh, you deduce, uh, this is due to bias, uh, you deduce the following. So in Rn, for any n, the free boundary is a C1 alpha uh, surface outside a closed set of singular points. And so there might be singular points, but their dimension is at most n minus five. So the, the, the singular set is a set is a closed set of Hausdorff dimension at most n minus five. Okay, so this is the best uh, we can say with uh, current methods. And as I said before, uh, it is not clear what happens in dimension five and six. So if you can improve this classification of low ups in dimensions five and six, then you improve this result to dimensions five and six. And then this number five here would change to a number seven. Okay, but this is completely open. Okay. And moreover, one last uh, thing to be mentioned here is that not only you get that the Hausdorff dimension is bounded by n minus five, but uh, it was also proved uh, quite recently by Nick Edelin and Max Engelstein in 2019 that the singular set is actually rectifiable. So it's n minus five rectifiable. And uh, this was done used the powerful methods of Naber and Malton. Okay, so this is the best we can say about the singular set in the Bernoulli problem, and I will not uh, discuss more about it here because I want to have time to discuss in more detail the obstacle problem. Okay. But I wanted to show you like what are the, the best known results, what are the kind of methods that we use here. And as we will see, the results and the methods are actually quite different in the obstacle problem. Okay. So for the Bernoulli problem, uh, just to summarize, we proved the problem, that the problem is a scale invariant. Uh, we can do blow ups thanks to optimal regularity and non-degeneracy. And, and moreover, blow ups are homogeneous thanks to bias monotonicity formula. And then in dimensions n less or equal than four, we can classify all blow ups and we only get the 1D solution. Okay, so this is a crucial step in the theory, the classification of blow ups. Right, and then the second crucial step is to prove that flat implies C1 alpha. Okay, and this allows us to deduce that in dimensions less or equal than four, the free boundary is C1 alpha everywhere. And in higher dimensions, well, we get that a singular set is small. Okay, so in dimensions bigger or equal than five, that the singular set is small. Okay, so and now you can uh, you may wonder. Uh, that there is one last step that is missing in the theory uh, that I mentioned before, and is uh, the following. So one last step is missing for this Bernoulli problem, and is the following. Uh, assume that the free boundary is C1 alpha in a very small neighborhood of the origin, then it is actually synfinite. This is the last step that is missing. Okay, and this completes the theory. And now notice that while in minimal surfaces, this is really immediate and it follows from Schauder estimates, uh, in free boundary problems, this is sometimes much more delicate. Okay, so in this case, the proof is uh, somehow short, but in some other problems, it can this can be quite quite delicate. Okay, so let me show the proof of this. This is a a, a new proof, uh, somehow new. I mean, this is for from the last five years, I think, due to Daniela da Silva and Ovidio Savin, and it shows that if the free boundary is C1 alpha, then it is infinite. Okay, and this completes the theory for the Bernoulli problem. So assume uh, we, we do it basically as an iteration by induction, say in K. Uh, assume that the free boundary is already C K alpha and K less, uh, greater or equal than one. 
Okay, and then we want to prove that it is actually k plus one alpha. Okay, and then if we do this, then we are done because we start from c one alpha, we get symphony. Right, so this is the step we want to we want to do from c k alpha to c k plus one alpha. And now, how do we do this? Well, uh, so this is a, a nice observation that comes. Uh, I mean, this is very typical, basically, from calculus. Uh, that the normal vector to the free boundary, because the free boundary is the zero level set, the, the normal vector to the free boundary is the gradient of u divided by the modulus of the gradient of u. Right? So this is true in general for functions and level sets. And then in this context, on the free boundary, we actually have that the modulus of the gradient is one on the free boundary. So this thing is one, this denominator is one, and this simplifies things very much. So really the normal vector is the gradient on the free boundary. Okay, so uh, basically we have to prove, you can even forget about the denominator because the norm is one. It is not one here on the positivity set, but on the free boundary, this is true. And moreover, say that we, because it already, uh, we already know that it's a C1 alpha surface, we can, uh, assume that it's a graph in the en direction. So, and this would imply then that the, the nth component of the gradient is positive. Okay, because the, the gradient has norm one. Okay, so then, uh, so this is a general trick for also that we work for the obstacle problem as well, that the normal vector, the ith component of the normal vector, you can write it as follows. So you write it as the, Ith component of the gradient divided by the norm of the gradient, and then you divide on top and bottom uh, by this nth component that you know it's positive. Okay, and then you write it like this and like this. Okay, and then you say, okay, but then the normal vector is this function. If I want to prove, uh, so I know already that. This is CK alpha, say, uh, sorry, CK minus one alpha. I want to prove it's more regular. So it's sufficient to prove, it's enough to prove that this function is regular, right? Because if these quotients are regular, then all this is regular. So the normal vector is regular, which is what I want to prove, right? So our goal will be to prove that these quotients, so UI divided by UN, where these are the derivatives of U, this quotient, are CK alpha, okay, this is the goal. Once this is CK alpha, then this is CK alpha, the numerator is CK alpha, the denominator is CK alpha because it's a sum of squares, and then there is a square root, but there is the one here, so this does not go to zero. Uh, so if everything is CK alpha, then all the quotient is CK alpha, so the normal vector is CK alpha. But then if the normal vector is CK alpha, then the, the, the surface itself is CK plus one alpha which is what we want to see, right? So basically the, our goal is to say the domain is CK alpha in this case. And I want to prove that this quotient of derivatives is CK alpha as well. Okay, so this is our goal here. Now, uh, how do we do this? Well, uh, U, our function U is CK alpha because we know that the domain is a harmonic function on a CK alpha domain, so we deduce that it's CK alpha. But this, of course, does not imply uh, what we want, right? So this is this property is not something general about harmonic functions. We need to use more that we have this solution of a free boundary problem. This is an overdetermined problem in a sense because we have kind of Dirichlet condition zero and Neumann conditions as well, right? So we have to use something something else. So u is only CK alpha because it's a positive harmonic, it's a harmonic function in a CK alpha domain. But uh, we, we want to prove that this is CK alpha as well. So we try to find a PDE for this quotient. Okay, so this is the idea. The idea is to look at this quotient, find a PDE for this quotient and see if using this PDE, we can deduce that this quotient is CK alpha. Okay, so notice that in general, uh, this function does not vanish on the, I mean, these two functions do not vanish on the boundary, okay? Because UN, it really converges to, it's one, for example, on the free, on, on the origin, on the free boundary, and then this in general does not vanish on the free boundary, so this is really a quotient of two positive functions, say, at least the denominator is positive. 
Uh, and then, so how do we find a PDE for W? Well, you just write down the following. So W multiplied by UN, right? W multiplied by UN, this is simply UI. And UI is a harmonic function. So the Laplacian of UI is zero. Okay, simply because U is a harmonic function, then UI is a harmonic function. So UN times W is a harmonic function. Okay, and now I expand. So the Laplacian of UN times W uh, is zero, but on the other hand, I expand it and I get that this is the Laplacian of UN times W twice the gradient gradient plus UN times Laplacian W. Okay, and now I use that UN is harmonic as well. So basically UN is harmonic, so this completely cancels this term. And now these two terms equal to zero, right? So, but these two terms, I can write them as uh, in divergence form. So I write them as the divergence of UN square greater than W equal to zero in omega, okay? And then this is my equation for W, okay? So even though the weight, so this equation has a weight here, it's a, it has some coefficients, say, which is simply u, un squared. Okay, so what is the regularity of this coefficient? So first, is this uniformly elliptic? Yes, this is uniformly elliptic, elliptic because un uh, here in a neighborhood, I mean, in a ball, say, in a neighborhood of the origin, this is uniformly positive up to the free boundary, up to the boundary, right? So this is really, it's bounded, is away from zero and infinity, so this is uniformly elliptic. And moreover, u is ck alpha means that u n square is c k minus one alpha. So these coefficients are c k minus one alpha. Okay, so this is an equation in divergence form with c k minus one alpha coefficients. Okay, and moreover, so the coefficients are nice. So I have a nice equation in a domain, but then if I want to get regularity up to the boundary, Okay, you want to get regularity up to the boundary here for this equation, you need an extra equation, uh, I'm sorry, a boundary condition for W. Okay, so in general, even though it solves an equation, you need a boundary condition if you expect to get boundary regularity, right? Because W is non-zero on the boundary. But it turns out what you can get is that uh, the normal derivative of W is zero. Okay, so this has to come from our free boundary condition. And then once I have this, well, I have a nice equation for W uh, with some uniform elliptic coefficients, and then they are CK minus one alpha with a bounded Neumann boundary conditions. Then by Schauder estimates for the Neumann problem, uh, I will get that W is really CK alpha. Okay, so if I can prove that this is true, then these two conditions plus Schauder estimates imply what you want. Okay, so, and how do we prove this? Well, uh, we prove, so, because the normal vector uh, to the free boundary is the gradient, to compute the normal derivative of W, I only need to compute the gradient U times the gradient W, okay? And then I compute, uh, I compute, and then I get that it's, this is the, so the gradient of W, you compute it explicitly, and then it's this, and then once I get, uh, I mean, this is really a computation, and then I I multiply, and then this is really a tangential. So you can you can show that this is a tangential uh, derivative of gradient u square. Okay, so this is not difficult to show. You can try to prove it as an exercise. Uh, so this is a derivative of modulus of so gradient u square in a tangential direction. Okay, but the modulus of u square uh, is constant. Uh, along the free boundary, right? So the modulus of u squared in a tangential direction uh, has zero derivative. So this is a tangential direction. Uh, and then the modulus is constant along the, the boundary. It means that the tangential direction, the tangential derivative is zero, okay? So since uh, this is CK minus one alpha, I have the Neumann boundary conditions then by Schauder estimates for the Neumann problem, we deduce that W is CK alpha, right? And if W is CK alpha, which is what we wanted to see, the normal vector is CK alpha, so the free boundary is CK plus one alpha, which is what we wanted, okay? So this completely 
proves the the result. This proves that the free boundary, if the free boundary is C1 alpha, then it is infinite. Okay, so basically this completes the theory for the for the Bernoulli problem. Okay, so this is the theory that I, I wanted to present here in this series of lectures. And this completes the last step, which is that C1 alpha implies C infinity. Okay, so the final theorem that we get for the Bernoulli problem is that the free boundary is C infinity outside a certain singular set, sigma, which has dimension bounded by house of dimension bounded by n minus five. Okay, and in particular, in dimensions four, three, two, or one, the singular set is empty. Okay, so the free boundary is completely C infinity everywhere up to dimension four. Okay, so this is the theory for the for the Bernoulli problem. Okay, so if you have questions about the Bernoulli problem, let me know well, either now or at the end of the, the lectures. I'll be happy to answer. Uh, and now what we will do is to go to, to the obstacle problem. Okay, so I want to discuss in uh, now in a separate uh, direction the obstacle problem in which we will see that what well, we already saw that the theory up to here, up to the fact that blowups are homogeneous, the theory was very parallel. Okay, and now we will see that actually the classification of blowups and even the proof of flat implies C1 alpha and so on, this and even the theorem itself, it's very different. Okay, so the, the theory for the obstacle problem and the kind of blowups that can appear and so on, it's quite different. Okay, so let's see. Now let's start with the obstacle problem and see what we can say about, uh, well, regular points, singular points, classification of blowups, etc. Okay. There's a question. Yeah. There's a question in the chat. I don't know. Okay, you... I didn't see it. Uh, Marie? Okay. Marie? Yeah. Wait, where is the chat? Maybe Hardy, if you want to, to just ask right now. Yes. Or... Yeah, you can unmute and ask. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, so... Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. So in the classification of blow ups uh, in three dimensions, uh, when you take the radio test function, should there be a Jacobian on the right-hand side? So in the classification of blow-ups in 3D, let me go there. Here? Yeah. Uh, so when, when I take a radial test function, I think this is exactly what you get. There is nothing nothing else. So, so it's integral a has squared and not integral r squared a has squared. Okay, maybe there, I don't know, there, maybe there is a typo or maybe I changed eta, uh, so let me see. No, I think it's all right because we're integrated in a set which is n minus one dimensional and then the- exactly. this comes. is on the free boundary. Yeah, this is on the free boundary. So this is different here. Yeah, this is a like a to the integral say, yeah, this is on the free boundary. So this is why this is really a uh, 1D integral, I think. Uh, right, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the questions. So, uh, okay. So, are, if there are other questions on the chat, let me know. Uh, I think I don't know where is the chat because I'm looking at this. I have the, the slides on the screen and then the chat is kind of uh, missing. Uh, okay. So, let's start then with the, with the obstacle problem. Okay. Uh, so the common properties that we have for the obstacle problem is the are the following. So the problem is scale invariant. The we can do blow ups. Blow ups are homogeneous thanks to the monotonicity formula. And then this is where we stopped, right? So this is what we proved for for the obstacle problem. And now we want to see well the, what is the classification of blow ups. Can we prove that once the blow ups are classified, then the free boundary is C1 alpha? Can we prove that once the free boundary is C1 alpha, then it is infinity? Okay, so these are the, the steps that we want to follow now. Okay, and then as we will see, there is one more thing, which is, well, what can we say about singular points? And this is what, this is what we will do at the, at the very end, okay, in the last lecture. Okay, so, and then as I already mentioned, but I want to, emphasize the two problems are quite different and this we will see it in the classification of blowups. Okay, so let's start with the classification of blowups for the obstacle problem, say in dimension one even. 
Okay, so we want to classify blow ups which satisfy that the Laplacian is uh, one in the positivity region, uh, U is C11, okay, because we know that uh, solutions are always C11, and in particular blow ups are C11, and the blow up is always homogeneous of degree two. Okay, so this is the equation. And now remember that the obstacle problem is a, is a, comes from a convex energy functional. So whenever you have a solution, it is a minimizer. So being a solution and being a minimizer is really the same. Okay, because the functional is convex. So while in the Bernoulli problem, we had maybe some critical points that were not minimizers and you had to distinguish and so on. And the classification of blow ups depended strongly on this. Now in the obstacle problem, this does not happen anymore. Okay, so in the obstacle problem, we will not use anymore the energy functional. You, you only use the equation because it's the same. Okay, so if you find a non-trivial solution to this, then it is it can appear as a blow up because it is really uh, a solution and therefore a minimizer. Okay, so now for the obstacle problem, this is a first important difference, which is that we only use the PDE, not the energy functional anymore. Okay, and now using the PDE, we can try to classify this. Uh, and now in dimension one, we have the 1D solution. Of course, this is the 1D solution that we expect. And it's a bit different from the Bernoulli problem because we know that they should look like a parabola, right? Because of the optimal regularity and non-degeneracy, we knew this, and then this is simply an ODE. So Laplacian equal to one, you get this, okay? And then zero on the other side. <clears throat> now, this is the analog of the 1D solution for the Bernoulli problem. And now in the Bernoulli problem, there was another solution that was like an absolute value. Right? And it was not a solution, uh, not even a critical point of the functional. Now here, you can, you can have a parabola like this. Okay, so there is no reason to discard a parabola like this, even in dimension one, this is really a solution. So an absolute value, like in the Bernoulli problem, it creates a singularity, it creates a, a, a singularity at the origin, but this one, it does not. So this one, it really is a, a, a minimizer of the energy. So this, can appear as a blow up even in dimension one. So this is somehow the singular point, okay? Even in dimension one, there is a point that is not this expected 1D solution in a sense, okay? So in dimension one, of course, it's difficult to say this is singular because it's really an isolated point, but these are the blow ups that will appear in higher dimensions as singular points, okay? And this solves everything in the here. So the Laplacian is one, in the positivity region, because it's one everywhere. <clears throat> the function is C11, yes, of course, and the function is too homogeneous. Yes, this is true. Okay, so even in dimension one, we already see there is a difference between the Bernoulli problem and the obstacle problem. Okay, so now we focus on this, and then we have these two kinds of solutions already in dimension one. Now, what happens? Uh, in higher dimensions, well, in higher dimensions, we have at least two types of solutions. Okay, so the first type of solution is the 1D solution, which is what we expect if the free boundary is like, say, as we expect that that connects like a zero region with the positivity region. With, when you do a blow up, you expect this to happen, to have a half space in which the function is zero and a half space in which the function is positive, and then this is the 1D solution. Okay, so it's a uh, explicit and given by this is the, this 1D solution. And we also have quadratic polynomials. Okay, so any quadratic polynomial of this type, okay, with a matrix A such that is non negative, uh, I mean, like positive definite, and then with trace one, this is an admissible blow up. Uh, this is an admissible solution, and in particular, an admissible blow up for the obstacle problem. Okay, so at least we have these two types of solutions in every dimension. And there is no difference so far, at least in terms of the di what dimension we are. So in all dimensions, we have these two, two kinds of solutions. Okay. And so what else? We want to classify blow ups in all dimensions a priori. Uh, and then we have this equation and we have at least these two types of solutions. So, and now the question is, are there any other solutions to the obstacle problem or not? Okay, so 
as I said, the, the first one is what you expect at regular points. Okay, so if the free boundary looks like this, then the blow up will look like this, the, the one dissolution, while the, the paraboloids, I mean the quadratic polynomials, is what you would have in cast like singularities. Okay, and this really happens. So whenever you have a cast like this and you do the blow up here, what you would get is a function that in the limit you zoom in more and more and then you get only a line here and then you get a line and the function will be positive here, positive here, and then you get uh, one of these paraboloids which satisfy the equation everywhere. Okay, so this is why these are the ones corresponding to regular points. These are the ones corresponding to singular points because these are the ones that you expect uh, in this kind of uh, free boundary points, while these are the ones you expect when you have cusps, for example. Okay, and then the same if you have a double cusp like this in R three, or you can you can have many different kinds of, of cusps if you want. Okay, uh, and uh, as I said, these cusps do appear in every dimension uh, for the obstacle problem, and this was proved by Schaeffer in seventy four. Okay, so he even constructed examples in, in, even in 2D in which you have infinitely many cusps like this one next to the other. Okay, so you can have really uh, much more, at least in 2D and in low, in low dimensions, much more wild uh, phenomena, but maybe we can still try to classify blow ups and understand what happens for singular points, right? But while in the Bernoulli problem, the singular set was small, here this is not true and they, it can appear in all dimensions. Okay, so now the question, the, the first question we have is, are these all possible blow ups? Okay, so this is the question that, that we want to, to answer, basically, right? We, having in mind that we already know that they appear. Okay, and then the theorem that we will prove in the next uh, lecture is the following. And the answer is yes, in all dimensions. Okay, so this is uh, somehow remarkable, I would say, because it's quite different from the, the Bernoulli problem in the sense that in all dimensions, you can classify blow ups. Okay, so for the Bernoulli problem, you can classify in low dimensions and then there are no blow ups other than the 1D solution, right? In the obstacle problem is different because uh, we cannot say that there is only the 1D solution because there are others, but we can say that these are all others. While for the Bernoulli problem, we are very far from proving anything like that. Okay, so in, for the Bernoulli problem, in higher dimensions, we don't know what could happen. Okay, we don't know what could what singular points could exist or could not exist. Okay, a priori there could be many very different ones. I mean, you don't know what can happen in higher dimensions. While in the obstacle problem, the result is the same in all dimensions, and it's this one. Okay, so this is a very classical result due to Caffarelli in 77. So this was a famous paper in Acta Mathematica uh, in which he proved for the first time the regularity of free boundaries for the obstacle problem. And basically this is contained uh, there. Uh, so for any blow up must be one of these two. Okay, so either the 1D solution or a quadratic polynomial. Okay, and you only use this equation in order to do this. Okay. So uh, these are the, as I said, these are the ones corresponding to regular points. These are the ones corresponding to singular points. So later on in the next lectures, we will see why, I mean, what can we say exactly about regular points, about singular points, and what are the best theorems we can prove. But uh, at least we have the, the, goal, the first goal, which is the classification of blow ups. Okay, and then in the last two minutes, let me say very briefly, how do we prove this? Okay, so we will do it uh, in the next lecture, but let me uh, finish with the one key observation, okay, that this is due to Caffarelli in this paper, which is convexity. So convexity of solutions is something that you don't have, uh, so convexity of blow ups, sorry, is something you don't have in other problems, but this is uh, a key point in the optical problem. Okay, so this convexity of blow ups is what will allow us to completely classify these in all dimensions, okay? So remember in dimension three, basically convexity was a key tool in classifying uh, blow ups, right? So this was the proof that I presented in which we use the stability condition 
but uh, in 3D, we use convexity very strongly because then convexity of a cone implies it's contained in a half space. So you can compare with the half space, while for general cones, you cannot do that, right? So convexity is something uh, that in the, in the Bernoulli problem we used in 2D and 3D, but it cannot be used in higher dimensions. While in the obstacle problem, in the obstacle problem, convexity is true in all dimensions. Okay, so this is a lemma due to Caffarelli, and we will prove it in the next lecture. So if you have any blow up, then it is convex. Okay, so this, this is actually more generally Caffarelli proved that any global solution, even if it's non-homogeneous, any global solution is convex. Okay, so and this is a important and particular property of the optical problem that will allow us to go much further in the theory. Okay, so let me stop here.